This is Minecraft, and this is also Minecraft. Same game, same models, same effects. So, why does one look so boring, and the other so beautiful? It's not high-res textures, it's not ray tracing, and it's not a low-level graphics API. It's just light. The right kind of light can turn even the simplest scene into something stunning. In this video, we'll break down how light creates realism. And by the end of this video, you will understand how simple scenes like Minecraft can look realistic and alive. Why even high detailed games can look flat without the right lighting. And what makes light truly realistic. Covering topics like direct and indirect light. Two PBR and various light models. You don't need ray tracing. You don't need expensive assets. You just need to know how light really works. So, how does light work? Well, light is energy. It travels from a source and interacts with whatever it hits. In the real world, this interaction is incredibly complex. But like with anything in computer graphics, we simplify it. Because simpler means faster. So what is the simplest way to describe light hitting a surface? Light has a direction. So does the surface. It's normal. The more they face each other, the more light the surface should get. Pointing straight at the light, bright. Turned away, dark. Somewhere in between, well, dimmer. We need a number that tells us how aligned those two directions are. That's exactly the mathematical properties of the dot product. Let's try normal dot light here, or n dot l. Same direction, one. Angled, between zero and one. Facing away, negative. Multiply that with the surface color, that's your lit color. Simple diffuse lighting, also known as lambertian. But something is missing. There is no shine, no reflection, no bright spot where the light hits just right. That's not ray tracing, that's specular. It shows up when light reflects towards the viewer. It's what makes metals shine, plastic gloss, what makes objects look realistic. That's the specular part of the light model. Now we've got two pieces to the puzzle, diffuse and specular. Together they're called direct lighting because they come straight from the light source. Calculated separately for every light source, like the sun, point or spotlights. So what happens when there are no lights at all? If a surface isn't hit by direct light, it goes completely black. And in the real world, well, that doesn't happen. Even in shadows, you can still see things. Why? Well, because light bounces off walls, off objects, off everything really. It scatters around and fills everywhere, even the dark spots. That's what we call indirect lighting. Simulating all these bounces is one way we call ray tracing. Not to be confused with reflections though, and it's expensive. So, like early graphics techniques, we fake it. We add a small constant color, a soft light that's everywhere. That is what we call ambient light. Now we've got the full picture. Diffuse, specular and ambient. Direct and indirect light. That's the foundation to every light model. And the model we just learned, we can now put a fancy word on. The Fong light model. But understanding this basic model is just the start. It really doesn't cover everything. And here is where things can go wrong when you do lighting. So far, we've looked at how light moves. But lighting also depends on what it hits. And this is where, if done wrong, we can immediately tell. So looking at Fong, with just diffuse, specular and ambient, wood, plastic and metal all look kind of the same. And if we want to differentiate them, we need to come up with something else. Surfaces behave differently when light hits. Some absorb it, some scatter it, some reflect it like a mirror. So how do we model that? That's where physically based rendering or PBR comes in. But before we go deeper, let's take a step back for a second. At the heart of the lighting model, PBR, Fong, anything really. There's one idea that ties it all together, the rendering equation. It's a formula that says light in equals light out, direct plus indirect, specular plus diffuse, all of it. Every shading model is just a faster, cheaper, more real-time friendly way to solve that equation. So how does PBR solve it? Now it's not just color and shininess. It's roughness, metalness, and energy conserving loss. Instead of faking how materials look, PBR try to imitate how the light actually interacts with materials. And one way we describe that interaction is through the BRDF, or bidirectional reflectance distribution function. It defines how surfaces reflect light based on the material properties. PBR uses BRDFs to make surfaces look right under any lighting, not just shiny or not, but physically correct 
it makes a huge difference. At first glance, the BRDF might look very complicated, but if we break it down, it's not as complex as it seems. Just like Fong, it has two main components, diffuse and specular. The specular part is made up of three terms, Fresnel, geometry and normal distribution. Imagine throwing a ball from the light to the surface. Fresnel is how many of those balls bounces perfectly towards your eye. Geometry is how many balls get blocked by the surface's own bumps on their way out. Normal distribution is how those bumps are spread across the surface. Each of these can be modeled with different functions. Common ones include Schlick's approximation for Fresnel, GGX for geometry, and Smith for normal distribution. And for the diffuse part, it's usually modeled with a simple Lambertian model, just like we did before. The key difference now is energy conservation. To achieve this, we divide the color by pi, or multiply by 1 divided by pi, a process known as reciprocal pi. This ensures the diffuse term is energy conserving over the hemisphere. So the BRDF handles how light reflects off a surface. But what if the light goes in instead? Think of skin, wax, marble. Light enters, scatters inside and exits somewhere else. That's what's known as subsurface scattering. Handled by extending the BRDF to BSDF instead bidirectional scattering distribution function. It lets us render lifelike materials, skin that glows, wax that feels translucent, eyes that feel alive. And this is where a lot of graphics applications cut corners. They skip proper material definitions, they rely on overly simple light models, or worse, they bake light into textures without accounting for the material properties. So even with the correct light setup and material properties, the world still feels fake. But there are definitely upsides with doing a simpler model, like runtime performance or having a specific style that you actually want. But you can't just light a scene without understanding the materials too. Indirect and direct light are just part of the story though. How light interact with the surface, that's what sells the realism. Ignore that and your game can have god rays, shadows, GI and ray tracing. And even with all that complexity, something still feels off. Shadows aren't deep enough, rooms feel flat, nothing really glows the way it should, like a ski on a white surface. That's because we're still faking it. Remember the ambient light? That constant color we added everywhere to fake indirect light? Well, just like I said, it's a total hack. And it doesn't really care where light is coming from. And it's a big reason for an unrealistic look. So what's the next step? We replace ambient light with something smarter. Instead of faking it, we start capturing the light that bounces around the scene. This is where global illumination or GI comes in. GI is the process of simulating indirect light, light that bounces off surfaces in the scene and contributes to the overall lighting. Let's start with one of the simplest forms. The indirect light is coming from the environment, the scene around us. So we sample light from the world itself, defining the world in a 360 degree texture cube. That's image based lighting. I by L. Instead of a flat color, we set the scene in direct light using the world cube map, capturing the world's light in every direction. Suddenly, the material reacts to the world. Metal reflects the room, and rough surfaces scatter it. But that's still just a snapshot. What we really want is light that bounces in the scene, dynamically and accurately, or at least have some more sense of locality. That's the essence of global illumination, trying to capture all this information in as smart way as possible. The holy grail of computer graphics. It's cool, it's fun, but it's really hard. So like the programmers we are, we have invented tricks. Like having multiple of these cube map snapshots in the world, baked into what is known as spherical harmonics, this is called light props. Breaking surfaces into patches that light each other, like each patch softly glowing and illuminating the ones it faces, known as radiosity. An extension to shadow mapping, but each pixel also stores color and direction, so you can bounce light from them onto the scene known as reflective shadow maps. Splitting the world in a 3D grid, called voxels, then we trace soft cones through it and gather the bounced lighting, known as voxel cone tracing. Bouncing light using only what's visible on screen, fast but limited to what's in view, known as screen space global illumination, or SSGI. 
Similar to voxels, storing light in cascade grids like layered volumes that track how light spreads over distance, known to us now as radiance cascades. Each a clever attempt to fake how light bounces. And finally, we say, can't we just ray trace it? Expensive, yes, but accurate and elegant. And with modern hardware, with a lot of performance help, and only doing it in certain conditions, it's finally possible in real time. Realistic lighting isn't just about how light hits a surface. It's about where the light comes from and what happens after. It bounces, it scatters, and it reflects. It fills spaces with ambient, indirect light. When games capture all of that, even with simple scenes, they can really feel alive. Not because they're more detailed, but because they treat light, how light wants to be treated. So let's take all of this theory and apply it to something we're all familiar with. Let's go back to Minecraft. Same models, same effects, but one version uses phone shading, diffuse and specular, the other uses PBR with the BRDF, with roughness, metalness and real material responses. One fakes indirect light with a constant. The other uses image-based lighting, even some dynamic bounce. And suddenly, the world feels different. Not because of higher res asset, not because of ray tracing, but because light mimics reality. That's why one looks flat and the other feels real. And if you have stayed with me this far, now you know exactly why light isn't just an afterthought. Materials should be designed with light in mind. It's the foundation of your game's full look. Even if realism isn't your goal, having a plan for your lighting and material should always be a priority. But here's the thing, we've barely scratched the surface. Because as we all know, real-time rendering isn't just about good lighting. It's about handling dozens of light, shadows and effects all in real time. So how do we pull all that off without risking the frame rate? For that, we need a smarter approach to rendering itself. And that is where deferred shading comes in. We'll break it down all in the next video.